Hi everyone, Dr. Hinky here with a chapter 16 video lecture. Um, this is our last chapter on this exam and then we will finish with uh, the immune system for our final unit before the uh, final exam. So chapter 16 covers disease and epidemiology. Uh, like the last chapter, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary associated with this, and a lot of it's going to be quite familiar to you already. Um, this is just going to give you more precise definitions for using that vocabulary, <clears throat> which, of course, we start with the language of epidemiologists. The learning objectives for 16.1 are to be able to explain the difference between morbidity and mortality and between prevalence and incidence. Um, so again, vocabulary, distinguish the characteristics of sporadic, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic diseases. We'll look at Koch's postulates and their modifications in determining the etiology of disease. And we'll explain the relationship between epidemiology and public health and the role of Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. So Epidemiology is the study of where and when diseases occur in a population. It looks at how they spread through a population. For infectious diseases, we have to know how they're transmitted and maintained in the world uh, in order to control them. The goal is to prevent outbreaks uh, and contain them when they do occur. And this is really the science that underlies all public health policy. When we look at disease within a population, there are statistics that we use um, to gain a picture of the state of that disease within the population. Morbidity is the state of being diseased. How many people are ill? How many people carry this? The morbidity rate is the number of cases of a disease expressed as a percentage of the population or it could be a number per standard part of the population. So per 100,000 people. Um, so it's not always percentage, which is per 100 people. Uh, if it's much more, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> if it's, if the numbers are lower, say it's one in, or 10 in 100,000, then that would just be such a small per fraction for percentage of 0.001. So, we can extend, extend that out depending on what's an appropriate level to discuss. So it's the number of cases per some portion of the population. And that lets us compare area to area by looking at within a similar size subpopulation, subgroup, how many could be expected to be affected. Prevalence is the total number or proportion of individuals in the population who are ill with it. And incidence is the number of new infections, uh, particular per, of how many dis new infections we have within a specific time. So everybody's kind of familiar with this, with the statistics we have for, for COVID. How many people are ill right now? More, some people become ill as others recover. So the numbers are constantly fluctuating. That morbidity includes new cases, uh, people who are in the declining phase of the illness uh, and those who are actively sick. So how many have been those who are recovered? How many cases of the disease do we have? Prevalence, how many are ill right now? As people recover, that number comes down, but as more people become sick, it goes up, so the total number is a balance of those, and incidents are the new infections within each specific period of time. How many new, um, new, newly infected individuals per day are the statistics we see in the Post and Courier for COVID. Mortality, uh, the number of deaths. We're looking at the mortality rate is the number of deaths from a disease expressed as some percentage or some portion of the population. So this is a graph um, comparing the incidence of HIV. So that's the number of newly reported cases. That's going to be constantly rising. There will always be newly reported cases. So that's a continuously upward curve. 
uh, and then the prevalence are new cases. So we can tell where we are in the trajectory uh, of a disease's progression through the population by looking at this. Are cases, new cases increasing or are they decreasing? Are we starting to get things under control? So we can look at uh, <clears throat> the patterns of incidence within a population and we can describe these uh, with the following terms, with sporadic disease. So sporadic diseases are things that are only seen occasionally. There's not a geographic concentration. Um, they just pop up here and there, relatively random occurrence, but just low background levels. Tetanus is an example of this. Endemic disease are those that are constant constantly present in low levels within a particular geographic region. So within a population, uh, within a given area, there's a disease that is typically present, not at extremely high levels, but it's just sort of always there in the background. Coccidioides is a fungus that causes valley fever, uh, and it is associated with dry or desert-like areas. And so within uh, drier, more desert-like conditioned areas, conditioned areas of the country like Eastern Washington and Oregon and the Southwest, there's always, uh, there are always cases of valley fever. So they're endemic. They're always there just at low levels. Epidemics occur when there are, is a higher than expected incidence within a particular geographic region. And so all of a sudden, that endemic d disease, that low background number, is much higher, grows uh, for some reason. And so epidemiology would try to determine what the reason is to control it. Uh, so flu seasons. Flu is sort of an, an endemic background thing. It's always there. But periodically, we'll have an exceptionally active flu season with a higher than expected number of individuals coming down with the flu bringing it to an epidemic level within a geographic region. Pandemics are global epidemics. So uh, typically we've spread an epidemic to at least three countries for it to be classified as a pandemic. Uh, and as we're seeing right now, every country. So it is a global epidemic. So epidemiology is the study of the spread of disease within a population. Etiology looks at the cause of disease. So we're finding cause, what is the causative agent? So if we are going to study an outbreak in the spread of disease, we need to know what's causing it. So this gets back to Koch's postulates as we talked about in chapter 15. Just seeing that a disease is present at the same time as a particular pathogen is not enough. Uh, if we did that, then all our normal biota would have an association. So just because a pathogen is present, say, oh, E. coli is always present in our body. That must be why we're sick. No, not really. Um, so it's we can't just have the presence of a pathogen and the disease. We have to have a controlled experiment. This is really one of the... Um, strengths of Koch's postulates. It was a systematic, controlled way to connect cause and effect, a pathogen with a disease. Uh, so having that evidence is important. Uh, you may have a hypothesis, hypothesis. Everybody has hypotheses. Their best guess about what's going on, but until you are able to gather evidence through a controlled experiment, that's all it is, is your guess. So Koch's postulates give us a legitimate evidence and data taking us from a guess to confirming our hypothesis of the causative agent or refuting that hypothesis, finding out is incorrect so that we can go on and find correct information or better information. So a number of public health organizations within the U.S. Center for Disease Control is the main national public health agency, and they maintain uh, an inventory of 
contagious or communicable diseases. And these are on the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System and regional, state, territorial, local public health departments um, report to this system for certain highly uh, contagious or highly pathogenic diseases uh, to monitor their spread, the epidemiology of those, and to try to bring any outbreaks under control. All right, so tracking infectious diseases, the job of epidemiologists. Uh, and this is just, this unit has some great, really interesting background uh, on John Snow, the father of epidemiology um, and his work, and Florence Nightingale and her work in uh, documenting and applying a systematic methodical method to identify sources and control those to control the spread of disease. And we'll also look at the vocabulary associated with some of this, um, common source spread, point source spread, and propagated spread of disease. So John Snow, the father of epidemiology, uh, mapped specific outbreaks or every occurrence of cholera in London in 1854. And by doing this was able to work backwards and track back to identify a specific water source that all infected individuals, um, that an infected individuals used, tracing that, that back to this common source of a well, a water pump in London as the source of the cholera outbreak. So when we talk about common source spread, we have a single source of the pathogen. Everyone who was infected was infected or contracted the pathogen at the same place. We have three types of common source, of common source outbreaks. Point source spread or a point source outbreak uh, is a common source that's available for only a short period of time. So there's limited opportunity for exposure, so there will be a limited spread. An example would be you're at a picnic and a uh, potato salad that has uh, staphylococcus or salmonella. Um, it's available for a short time. There are a limited number of people associated with it. We can easily track them down. Um, and so we can identify what that causes and have an idea of how far it will spread and how much concern that is to the public to greater good. A continuous common source would be a common source that's available for a lengthy period of time. So longer than just one incubation period. Uh, so for example, that contaminated water source. Uh, swimming pools would be an example. Uh, common water source. So things that can house um, or be a reservoir for a pathogen. And then we can have intermittent common source spread. These are infections that uh, pop, crop up occasionally because the common source is only contaminated occasionally. So an example would be water sources that are only contaminated after large rainfalls, like people slogging through uh, the floodwaters downtown after a heavy rainfall where those are in those waters are filled with fecal matter um, and with E. coli and other bacteria that are associated with that. So as people walk through those, you see a higher incidence of infections uh, where people are exposed and be open, open wounds or cuts uh, and then go walk through that water and are exposed. So you'll see little rises and outbreaks of maybe staph infections during that time or shortly after after that. Propagated spread is when we have direct or indirect person-to-person -person contact. So a propagated spread, uh, you can think it kind of extends out in waves. One person comes into contact with three people. Now we have three people that each come in contact with three people. It goes to nine. Those nine come in contact with 327. So we get this blossoming effect that can be either through direct contact or through indirect, through fomites, which we'll get to the, that, that vocabulary in a bit. Somebody blows their nose, leaves their tissue on the table. Then later on, somebody else comes by and is exposed to that. 
Um, so that's indirect contact uh, or just through direct contact with individuals who are infected. Okay, another name commonly associated with epidemiology is Florence Nightingale. Uh, she was a nurse who during the Crimean Wars in, 18, in the mid-1800s took care of British soldiers. And through her um, very meticulous record keeping, looking at the causes of illness and death, and graphing out, mapping out that data um, to get measurable, quantifiable, and actionable information rather than just a, an opinion or a gut feeling about what was going on. She tracked backwards using the data of what was happening, what she was seeing in those deaths, and discovered that most casualties of war were not from actual battle wounds or battle injuries, but because of preventable uh, infectious disease. And we've already talked about Joseph Lister, who, yes, the mind-breaking or the the uh, mind-bending, amazing realization that, lo and behold, clean surgical tools and washing your hands can prevent the spread of disease. All right, our next chapter or section. 16.3, the modes of disease transmission. Here we look at a lot of words, again, familiar vocabulary, um, but with specific meanings that when we use these words colloquially, just in casual conversation, might not reflect the accurate definition. So pay attention to these. Uh, we're going to describe the different types of disease reservoirs, different types of carriers, different uh, modes of transmission, and then look at the terms quarantine and nosocomial infections or healthcare associated infections. So reservoirs and carriers. Reservoirs are a place where the pathogen normally resides. This is where I can be exposed to it because this is where I find it in the real world around me can be a living reservoir. For example, bats who have all sorts of coronaviruses, uh, they are not impacted by the virus. The virus does not affect them. They just carry it and therefore can spread it to uh, susceptible individuals. Can be non-living reservoirs like soil or water. Uh, so harbors, um, not harbor, sorry, soil harbors pathogens like fungus, uh, Clostridium tetani, but it's just normal bacteria that live in those areas that can be opportunistic if we give them an opening, like having a cut. It can be a body of water that's contaminated either uh, with fecal contamination, urine contamination. It can be a human who is infected who carries the pathogen as a carrier. So carriers, this would be a reservoir, uh, a human reservoir who's an individual that's capable of transmitting a pathogen but doesn't display the symptoms. We can have passive carriers who are not themselves infected. So healthcare workers, for example, who may transmit a pathogen, uh, may have physically been exposed to it, may have it on a fomite, on gloves, um, on their hands some other way and can transmit it even though they themselves are not infected. Or they can be active carriers who are, who are infected and transmit the pathogen to others. They may be asymptomatic or they may have symptoms. So an asymptomatic person is an active carrier who does not present signs or symptoms of the disease despite being infected. And yes, asymptomatic transmission does happen. It is a thing. Um, so carriers, doo -doo -doo, like typhoid Mary, and she is a most famous example of this. Typhoid Mary uh, was a cook and through a subclinical infection of salmonella, um, 
was the carrier of that. So she was a cook for many families and lo and behold, you tra tracked back the families that she went on to work for and then the restaurants that she worked in uh, had an incredibly high rate of transmission or of cases of, uh, of typhus and was able to track back even though she was not symptomatic she did spread that. So there's a video when you open this PowerPoint, you can see that video. All right, so the different types of transmission. We have contact transmission, which is just like it sounds. We need direct contact. Contact transmission through direct contact means there's transmission between hosts by physical contact or in droplets when you're face to face. Uh, so it doesn't have to be physical, physical contact between your body, but between droplets that are expelled from one body touching the next body. <laughs> so vertical direct contact would be mother to child during pregnancy, birth or breastfeeding. So that's mother to child, parent to child. Horizontal direct contact is person to person. So touching, kissing or sexual intercourse. And droplet transmission is droplets from mucus or coughs or sneezes expelled over distances of less than a meter. And that direct contact of those droplets um, is how it's transmitted. We can have indirect contact. This is when we have transmission between a host uh, and a subsequent infected person through contact with a fomite. So the infection is spread not person to person. I don't have to be in the same room. I don't have to be at the same time. Again, I don't have to be present at the same time. You can, don't necessarily know an infected person was even present, uh, but they leave behind the pathogen. So this is uh, indirect contact. Fomites are inanimate or non-living objects that the pathogen can be found on. It can be a towel, it can be a shared needle, it can be a door handle, uh, a cup, a tissue. And so non-living uh, objects. Vehicle transmission. This one's easy to confuse. People are often tripped up by vehicle transmission with vector transmission. Vehicle transmission occurs through I always think of this as a vehicle transmission is something that's flowing. So transmission through water. It's flowing and carrying the pathogen to different places to spread it. Air, flowing through air ducts. So dust and aerosols can travel. Um, for this is uh, greater than one meter, travels through air ducts, can be passed from room to room or to people who come into the room later after it's gotten into the air. Uh, this is also food. So foodborne and waterborne outbreaks are vehicles. So that's the vehicle through which the pathogen travels. Vector transmission, typically we think about an arthropod, an animal. So this is not zoonosis. This is not where a, an animal virus mutates so that it is able to infect humans. This is that the pathogen is carried by an animal, usually an insect, an arthropod an insect, uh, to spread it from one host to the next, to the next. So an animal, an insect, carries the pathogen from one host to the other and is not infected. So we can have biological vectors. Biological vectors are uh, those arthropods or insects or organisms that the pathogen uh, reproduces in. So it's internal, it is in the organism, uh, and then it, the vector transmit the pathogen, transmits the pathogen from one host to another. That would be uh, like a mosquito harboring plasmodium, causative agent of malaria. Uh, that plasmodium reproduces or is, and is carried. It's in, carried in the mosquito and through that bite is biologically put into the host. Um, 
and through that bite, if the mosquito bites someone who's infected, that's how it picks it up to begin with. And so we are going to transmit it that way. Um, mechanical vectors are when they just carry the pathogen on the outside of their body and drop it off. So like a housefly picking up a pathogen on its feet when it lands and then moving on and landing on something else and leaving behind the pathogen. And there, uh, we talked about many of these when we talked about the eukaryotes of microbiology um, as the species that carried the protists or the pathogens that we looked at. Um, so black fly, fleas, kissing bugs, lice, mites, mosquitoes, sand flies, ticks, tsetse, tsetse flies, uh, and the diseases that they carry. All right, quarantining. Hey, we're all familiar with this one now, aren't we? Quarantining is the isolation of individuals to prevent transmission of the disease to others. This has been done uh, for tuberculosis outbreaks in the past, for Ebola transmission, um, and in the U.S. We've had quarantines uh, put into place to prevent the spread of cholera, diphtheria, tuberculosis, uh, influenza, and now COVID-19. Quarantining is an extremely effective method to prevent the transmission, especially when um, something is easily or highly communicable, so, contag so very contagious. Healthcare associated infections. These are nosocomial infections. Uh, Iatrogenic, we learn, these are connected with surgery. So iatrogenic are a subset of nosocomial. Nosocomial are those that are acquired within a healthcare setting. They say the patient was admitted for a reason other than the infection. So a nosocomial infection, if you go into the hospital with pneumonia, that's not nosocomial, you're in the hospital because you had pneumonia beforehand. And then if you come up with a secondary um, infection, like a staph infection, a MRSA infection, the MRSA would be the nosocomial infection. So uh, it's picked up while you are in a healthcare setting. It is a huge, huge matter of concern uh, within the healthcare industry. It costs billions of dollars to the healthcare industry each year, as well as a number of human lives. And here's a breakdown of the most frequently occurring um, healthcare associated infections. In 2011, this is the most recent and complete uh, data I think that they had evaluated when the book was published 720,000 healthcare associated infections, 22% related to surgical sites, 22% due to pneumonia. 13% were urinary tract infections and 10% were bloodstream infections. All right, and then our last section of this chapter uh, deals with global public health. So talking about the World Health Organization and their role in public health and looking at two classes, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So as we read this, um, emerging infectious diseases and re-emerging, these are things that have been on the radar for the CDC, uh, for WHO, for decades. They have been sounding the alarm um, and telling countries to be prepared, to be prepared because an outbreak of the magnitude we're experiencing right now is not surprising. It should not have caught anybody off guard. Uh, there have been more than ample warnings. There have been more than ample plans um, proposed, put forward, uh, templates for plans for countries to use through these organizations. Uh, they have given examples. And because some countries are more prepared than others, number of outbreaks, potential pandemics have been averted over the past 40 years. Uh, and it's not until we bury our heads in the sand, uh, stop listening to the evidence that's presented, 
uh, and pretend that, hey, can't happen to us, um, that we end up with problems. So our current pandemic, our current situation is not anything that should have been caught, that should have caught anybody off guard. It's not anything that anyone should have said. Nobody could ever have predicted this or seen this coming uh, because epidemiologists have seen this coming and have been planning for it and trying to get governments to pay attention and plan as well for decades. Uh, but we chose the bury our head in the sand approach instead, not a good way to deal with disease. So the World Health Organization is an agency within the United Nations that coordinates international public health issues and promotes communication between countries because as we see, pandemics don't pay attention to borders. They are responsible for monitoring and reporting infectious disease on a global scale. They develop and implement strategies for control and prevention. They share these with governments. Uh, and they work with each government's national agency with us, that would be the CDC, to try to disseminate information, disseminate alerts, uh, on emerging and re-emerging diseases of concern. They do not have any control or authority over what any nation's government choose to do with that information. And so when people were concerned that, oh, the World Health Organization is going to take everything over and invade our country, to, they have no authority to do that. All they can do is monitor, watch, study, and use good sense to try to get other, to get governments to hopefully use good sense as well. So when you talk about emerging and re-emerging disease, emerging diseases are new to the human population. They have shown an increase in prevalence in the previous 20 years. Um, Ebola came about, SARS, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, West Nile. We've got all kinds of emerging diseases uh, and now COVID. And so for at least 20 years or more, um, the CDC and WHO have been on the watch and trying to raise alerts. And when governments listen, we can nip those in the bud. Um, but there are a number of emerging diseases and there are more and more. And a big concern now is that with climate change, we will see an even an ever increasing rate of these emerging as areas that are frozen thaw and um, pathogens that humans have not been exposed to in the past because they have been in ice uh, are going to start to impact us. We also have re-emerging diseases in that category, which are diseases that had been in a period of decline things like tuberculosis and malaria, but are now increasing. Again, with climate change, a lot of the organisms, the pathogens that are responsible for spreading these are limited to tropical and subtropical areas. Uh, but as temperatures warm in temperate zones, we are seeing those, uh, the pathogens related with those, the protists in many cases moving, um, the insects that carry them moving into new zones where they had not been found before. And so these are huge areas of study. And this is our global image of all of the different emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that the CDC and WHO are monitoring, keeping track of to see where they are spreading to, if their numbers are increasing or decreasing. Those in red, are newly emerging diseases. So people think newly emerging diseases are rare or a, uh, some sort of surprise. Well, there are a number of them that uh, the CDC is monitoring and that who are, that those agencies are monitoring. Nope. Oh, and in blue, we have re-emerging or resurging diseases. And, oh, anthrax. This is a deliberately emerging disease it means humans are concentrating and spreading it. So uh, it's a really interesting chapter and definitely relevant. Uh, also, um, 
as you play Plague Inc., I'm sure a lot of you are saying, oh, yeah, I know what this is. Um, so that should help you to connect the vocabulary uh, with the concepts in this chapter. Right now, I think we're all very uh, familiar with the vocabulary of this chapter. All right, that covers everything on this exam. And then we'll move on to our final chapters on the immune system for our last week of class. All right. Good luck on the test.